Thank you, Francis, for being here today and sharing your thoughts on work in relation to prisons. Um, and most importantly, to discuss what the future could bring when it comes to work in relation to closed settings. So can you explain what the Howard League is and what the organization does? Well, the Howard League for Penal Reform is an independent organization, independent NGO. We're a charity under legislation in the UK. Um, we do not accept funding from the government. So that's why I stress independence. Uh, we have a turnover of about a million pounds a year. We carry out research. We do campaigns and we're our main purpose is to achieve change across the criminal justice and penal systems. And you are the chief executive of Howard League for a long time. When and how did you start at Howard League? Actually, I'm about to retire. Um, I've been around for more than 30 years here. Um, and the, the organization itself has been going for 150 years. We were, the organization was set up when there was a royal commission looking at capital punishment in the UK, and it ended public executions. And then people started to ask the question, well, if you're not going to execute people in public, so that punishment is a public display and punishment started to go behind closed doors and be more secret. What do you do with people? What is the best way to respond to antisocial behavior and to crim criminality? And that's pretty much the question we still ask. Um, what is the current situation in the UK when it comes to work inside prison and work after release? Well, we have um, a, a very large prison population, mostly adult men. We have about 500 children. We have three, just over 3,000 women. This is England and Wales, which is a separate jurisdiction. Um, and we have 75,000 or so um, adult men. Um, obviously, things have changed slightly because of COVID, but uh, we still have a very large number of men who are sentenced for very long periods of time um, often we have whole life sentences where people are told they're going to spend their whole life in prison. But we have about 40,000 men who are serving long sentences. Um, that's over four years, four years to life. And they spend their time pottering about in what are basically pyjamas um, without doing anything useful. Over the last year, of course, they've been lying in their cells. But anyway, before that, people just potter. It's run like a bit like an old people's home. Um, and it means that people will do a little bit of work on the wings, they'll do a bit of cleaning, there'll be a bit of tidying up. They may work in a factory where they do a little bit of piecework, which they're paid for bit by bit. But it's very desultory. It's only for a few hours a day. They will earn something like £10 a week. Um, but they have to pay for their own phone calls and buy their own toothpaste and deodorant and supplement their diet because the food is very poor. So it's, it's a really grim thing and it does not prepare people for release, of course. So everyone is very surprised when people don't get jobs on release or if they do get a job, they don't keep it. Because for the last four, five, six years, they haven't taken responsibility for themselves they've been asleep most of the time. They haven't had to have a shower every day. They haven't had to get up and have breakfast and sort themselves out for a day's work. So even if they do get a job, which most don't, they don't keep it. So after a year, about 75% of former prisoners are not employed. That's a higher rate. Yeah. So on an interesting project on, of real work in prison, the Howard League states, the legacy of prison graphic design studio Barbed is a powerful one. The lessons learned from this path-breaking initiatives have transformed individual lives and ways of thinking about prison work. Barbed provided a model for the way in which work in prison could inspire and transform lives. So a few years ago, the Howard League started the project Barbed, Barb, uh, and it finished uh, as well, I think. Uh, can you tell more about this project and the vision behind it? And maybe what lessons can you share with us about this project, Barbed? Barbed. First, first of all, the practical and then the principle. I would normally do it the other way around, but I think it's more interesting to learn about the practical side. Uh, we set up a graphic design studio inside a training prison. 
Holdingley, which is just outside London. We recruited um, competitively six prisoners to be trained for six months on becoming graphic designers. So they had no background in it, but we trained them full time. And they came to work and we gave them a training salary. After six months, it was run as a business. So it wasn't a project, it was a business. And the idea was that they would be employed properly by us on the same contract of employment as I am. They would get paid holiday, they could um, have a say in, in, in their work environment, and they were paid the rate for the job. Not the living wage, not pocket money, but a proper wage that you would expect to get. So actually they were paid outside London. They were paid about £16,000 a year um, and they could save for that. Now out of that, they did have to give a little bit of money back to a fund which they jointly managed with the prison and with the Howard League to give money to victims. Because for you and I, you know, it, our salaries, we have to pay for rent, light, heat, keep rent, you know, uh, travel and they couldn't pay for that because you can't pay for your own imprisonment so we said you will have to pay a certain amount into a fund which they did and we gave donations to various other ch um, ch charities dealing with families of prisoners so we ran it as a business they would get contracts to do design leaflets to design uh, posters um, letterhead paper all sorts of things for outside organizations and we were paid for that so we were, it was a proper business and the important thing here was that because they were paid a wage they were paying tax and no one has ever done that before they paid income tax to the government because they were employed it was not a project it was it was a proper employment um, and that was part of the principle i felt was really important that if you are a prisoner and you are working you are a citizen too and paying tax is not something that's voluntary if you are employed you pay tax and that contributes to the commonwealth the common good of everybody it builds roads street lighting the health service everything and that, i felt that was really important but but tax because it's not voluntary means that you are actually employed um, and this gives you as an individual as i have i have employment rights everybody in the eu and everybody in the uk even now we're not in the eu although i would like to be um, has employment rights there is law that protects you as an employee and that because the prisoners were employees they acquired those rights and that's what the prison service, after about five years, suddenly noticed that they had prisoners who had rights, which was absolutely the, the principle underpinning the whole thing. Um, and the prison service said, oh, no, you can't pay tax and you can't have rights. So they paid us back all of the tax money that we'd paid um, into the government. And um, we closed the, the business down because it was not a project, it was a business. But what we did show is that you can employ prisoners properly, they can have a proper wage, and they can have rights. They didn't go on strike, they didn't abuse those rights. They did save up enough money so that when they were released, they had some money. They did get up at eight o'clock in the morning, have breakfast, shower, turn up to work, do a full day's work, and then go back in the evening. And that's what I think people should be able to do. Shouldn't be forced to do it. This is not forced labor. You don't want to do it, don't do it. But the advantages, as we all know, in, in working are that you get camaraderie, you get friendship, you get a social life, you get treated with respect, and you save some money, and you can buy things that you want to buy. So the principle, I think, is something that other countries could look at very seriously. But there are consequences to giving prisoners rights. And I have no problem with that at all. Do you know what the current situation is with the rights of people in prison when it comes to work? They have no rights. They have no rights. OK, I, I know in, in any country. In the Netherlands, they have, to some extent, at the moment, they have some rights, but with the new law, they have no rights at all anymore. So it's actually changing in the in the negative direction that way. 
Um... So they don't have employment rights. And I think that there's difference, you see. I mean, everybody has hum under human rights, obviously. They, you know, they, they can't chop bits off you and, and publicly execute you and they can't, you know, there are certain treatment rights. Those are human rights. That's different. That means that you can't be held arbitrarily in, social, in, in solitary confinement or you, you know, of course, everybody, the, there are human rights which are guided by the UN Convention on Human Rights, by the Council of Europe. Uh, we've got the, the, the um, Anti-Torture Committee coming, you know, they come every now and again to protect. We have all sorts of human rights. That's different. Employment rights are something that no prisoners anywhere in the world have. And I think that would be the greatest, most revolutionary thing to give prisoners, more so than the vote, because most prisoners wouldn't vote anyway. And there are places where some prisoners vote, but they may vote, but they don't. But actually giving people employment rights, as we all know, in the real world that we all inhabit outside prison, it is employment that gives us status and that gives us more rights and more power and more say over our lives. You know, you can go into conflict with your employer, you can do all sorts of, that is what I want prisoners to have. And that is what's really revolutionary. Like it. The Howard League wrote a report, Business Behind Bars. Uh, I think this was based on this project Barbed. Barbed, is that true? Well, we called the business Barbed to differentiate it uh, and that prisoners chose that name. Mm -hmm. uh, differentiate from Howard Lee, because although we were running it, it was an independent business. Yeah. And the report was written years after the business closed, I think. What was your aim and hope with this uh, report? I've been carting it around talking to our government ministers ever since, um, in trying to get them to persuade them that this is quite a new and revolutionary idea, particularly now we're not in the EU, particularly mm -hmm. now that, that everyone is concerned about uh, supply lines. So, for example, shipping is one of the most polluting parts. It is polluting the seas, shipping. Mm -hmm. and, and yet most of the products that we, we buy in the, in the shops are shipped thousands and thousands of miles, polluting the seas, killing the dolphins. And actually, if you do production, if you set up factories inside prisons, uh, you would have a, a, a you know, good employees because they want to work. It would save the environment um, and prisoners would be able would have an opportunity to work. So there is a lot of common sense to it. You would also then prepare them for um, employment on the outside. I'll give you an example. I went into a prison um, before lockdown before the COVID, and they were training to do bricklaying. I saw a prisoner who was in his 30s, so he was not that young, learning how to be a bricklayer. Well, you'd think that would be a great thing to do. He had a brick, and he put a bit of cement on it, and he laid it out. And I think that morning he laid three bricks. Well, no one is going to employ anybody who only lays three bricks in a morning. I mean, it's complete nonsense. My business, they worked a proper day's work. They, you know, I want people to do a proper day's work for a proper day's pay and with rights. But I haven't yet persuaded anybody of the, that to do this. Perhaps in, in the Netherlands, you can, you can get it done. <laughs> And hopefully, definitely, in 100 years' time, we will have that in all countries, the employers' rights, employees' rights. Um, so what, what did you find out regarding public support on working for normal wages in prison? Well, actually, I got support from the right-wing press, because the idea that the prisoners... Um, at the moment, there's a lot of antagonism towards prisoners, because they get given food. They get given, you know, they don't have to earn anything. And it looks like they're getting everything for free. And in fact, what they're getting is disgusting food. And, you know, they're sharing their cells with rats and cockroaches. But, you know, it's it, it's what the public sees. So if we could say to, um, to people, look, prisoners will earn money legitimately. And if they want to go to a gym, just like you and me, they'll have to pay for it. And if they want a nice duvet, just like you and me, they can pay for it because they will have the money just like you and me to do so so it's about bringing the real world into prisons but the only difference is there's a wall um, between now this is not encouraging people to go to prison it's not encouraging the use of prison but the realistically there are a lot of people in prison who have done really horrible things 
um, and maybe going to spend some time in custody. And I want to revolutionize, change the way that prison works. And actually it got a lot of public support because people could see there was a logic to it. And then if people are released, they're much more likely to get a job because they'll have proper skills, they'll have some money in their pocket to pay the rent, and they'll be able to keep their families as well. And if they want luxuries, they can pay for them, just like I have to. Um, so reskills works towards the situation that every person should be able to perform work for normal wages, regardless of where a person resides. And together with the neighborhood and in council consultation with the residents of the detention house, it should be possible to look at what is needed concerning jobs in that neighborhood and how residents of the detention house can develop themselves at the same time. So what do you think about this? I think that's a really interesting idea. I think it has to, of course, be voluntary because you cannot have forced labor. Um, it has to be people have to want to do it and you can't force people to work. Um, that's been that's been um, illegal, unlawful across Europe ever since the concentration camps and the Second World War, um, and quite rightly. Um, so I think training people is great, but if you're going, to, if you've got a man who's committed a really serious violent offence and in this country is going to spend 15 years in prison, training is okay for six months or even a year, but doesn't get you very far. It doesn't fill up the next 15 years. So actually training is great if you're on a short sentence, if you're only in for a few months or a year or two, but for the longer sentence people, it's no good because the training runs out. Um, of course, people should be able to get education and training, but if you're working, I do extra courses, I do extra training, which I pay for, and I do in the evenings or at weekends. So you can do that as well if you're on a long sentence. People can pay for it. Why should the state pay for that? If you're earning 18, 20,000 a year, um, it's, you know, it's a decent, decent amount of money. If you're not paying any rent or anything, people should be able to pay for their extra training. Why not? So what will the future look like of work in prisons? And does anyone have the right, does everyone have the right and obligation to work regardless of what some, someone has done in the past? Well, at the moment, uh, people in prison are, are meant to get a bit of a, a job. Of course, there aren't, there's not enough work for everybody. So if you're unemployed in a prison, you get a two or three pounds a week as unemployment money, just so that you can buy a bar of chocolate and some toothpaste. Um, even the people who, who do get a job, as I say, they can only earn 10, 15, possibly 20 pounds a week. Um, so I, I think we really need to change the whole system um, completely. Um, and obviously, what the Howard League works for is, is, is fewer people in prison. Uh, we want to uh, see uh, the prisons used very, very sparingly. But recognising there will be prisons, I want to revolutionise the way they work completely. Um, and, uh, and, and change it. it. It doesn't look like it's going to happen. And as I say, I'm retiring in a few months, so I'll, I'll hand this over to somebody else to do perhaps in another country. And what will you do after retirement? <laughs> I'm a grandmother. I'm going to interfere in my grandchildren's lives. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything else you would like to share with us? Let me know how you get on and good luck. We will. So thank you for your time and keep up the good work. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.